and rounds. Uh, today we're very excited to welcome Dr. Jonathan Posner from the UW College of Engineering. So Dr. Posner uh, completed his PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering at UC Irvine and went on to be a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. He came to us in 2011 from Arizona State University. Here he's the Brian McMinn Endowed Associate Professor in the Departments of Mechanical Engineering and Chemical Engineering, an Associate Professor of Molecular Engineering and Adjunct Faculty in Family Medicine. He directs the Engineering Innovation and Medicine Program that develops technical solutions to challenges in healthcare um, with interdisciplinary teams of students and faculty in engineering and the health sciences. His research focuses on micron and nanometer length scale fluid dynamics and transport physics at the interface of chemistry, biology, and the environment. His work in electrokinetic systems has enabled novel technologies that are broadly applicable to the healthcare field. It's resulted in development of highly sensitive point-of-care immunoassays and nucleic acid point-of-use diagnostics. His work in nanotechnology has shown the ability for engineered nanoparticles to interact with model cell wall membranes with implications for cell transport and delivery. He has been involved with the development of a novel airway device for use in neonates, a football helmet designed to reduce traumatic brain injury, and the multidisciplinary development of natural draft clean cook stoves and the use of fuel cells as a source of cost-effective potable water. And none of that is impressive at all. <laughs> <laughs> he is the recipient of numerous awards, the titles of which indicate his early promise and position at the frontier of science, technology, and healthcare. He is the recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award, which is the highest honor bestowed by the U.S. government on outstanding scientists and engineers beginning their independent careers. He's been recognized for his excellence in experimental research by the von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics in Belgium. In 2015, he received the best paper award, and indeed it was called the top paper in the last five years from the Journal of Environmental Quality. And finally, this year, he is the recipient of the Inventor of the Year Award from the UW School of Medicine for his collaborative work on the football helmet designed to mitigate forces thought to contribute to concussions. So please join me in a very warm welcome for Dr. Jonathan Posner and his discussion on engineering innovation in medicine. Is this, uh, can you hear me? Uh, thank you for that very warm welcome, and um, I normally don't get to hear about myself that way, and so it's a, it's a, you did a very nice job. Um, <laughs> the, um, I, I guess you don't get to hear from engineers very often, and uh, I will try to uh, talk about our work at the interface of, of medicine and engineering, um, and uh, I will do my very best to not act like I'm educating you on medical problems, but just uh, use the information that I have to, uh, to drive the work that we've done. I hear that this is, uh, this is not commonplace for engineers, but I heard we're supposed to talk about disclosures and potential conflicts of interest. I've started two companies. One is this helmet activity, and the other one is on a diagnostics for the point of care. So I'll just mention that real quick. So I want to talk about the interface of medicine and engineering. Um, last week, I don't know how many of you were here for uh, Dr. Nathan White's seminar, uh, but he spoke about a lot of his work across engineering, working on um, uh, blood and uh, stopping bleeding in emergency situations. And uh, so it seems thematic that I would speak this week, uh, maybe from the engineering side, uh, but really this confluence or this intersection of how engineers and uh, people in the health sciences can work together. Now, there's a really rich history in medical technology uh, I, I think you could write probably 10 volumes of books on this. You all know about the technology that surrounds you and how it enables you and maybe gets in your way sometimes. Um, but uh, the first sort of record I could find of a medical technology was this uh, almost 1000 BC, this Egyptian prosthetic toe. There may be better references, but that's actually a quite a beautiful uh, prosthetic toe. And uh, the reading that I could find on it said that it's not wasn't actually very functional for replacing, you know, a balance or, or, or um, you know, being able to stand, but was more for uh, aesthetics. Uh, the stethoscope uh, was uh, something that probably that you've all you you know all use daily is uh, was came about uh, by uh, Rene Lenec in 1815. Uh, it started off with this little uh, wooden uh, tube, basically. It's almost like a rolled up poster. 
1841, the first operation using anesthetic, uh, which of course makes surgical procedures so much more comfortable. The x-ray in 1895 by a German physicist, uh, Wilhelm Röntgen. And uh, he, I think this is a picture of his wife's hand, is my understanding. And he won the very first Nobel Prize in physics for his work in x-ray. Uh, in 1943, um, the Wilhelm Kolff, who was a Dutch physician, uh, was the first one to do dialysis. These are washing machine parts and, and parts from tin cans. So very crude. Uh, and this, I believe, was done in the Netherlands under uh, um, Nazi uh, occupation. But this didn't really make dialysis practical. It wasn't until just a few years later that here at UW, Wayne Quinton, who was an engineer of sorts but working in the School of Medicine, again with a building Scribner, uh, created the first shunt. And this made access uh, to dialysis possible. And then they started, I believe, the very first um, uh, commercial or outpatient dialysis facility ever here in Seattle, which is in the location of that travel lodge, is my understanding, right across the street from U Village, which is still there, I guess the basement of the travel lodge. So, um, you know, this also brings to the point that we have a tremendous amount of um, medical device innovation here at UW, a very rich history of that in ultrasound and dialysis and many other areas. And so some of the work that I'm going to talk about today is about how we can systematically uh, energize and catalyze more of that type of innovation and do it at the faculty level, but also at the student level so that we can continue to innovate and be leaders in the area of, of um, innovative technology for medicine and health sciences. So the Engineering Innovation in Medicine program is, is an academic program. It works with faculty and students. Uh, sort of part of our mantra is that students are the university's uh, best asset and the most creative asset and one that's continuously uh, rejuvenated with new classes and, and new energy. And so basically what we do in this program is we try to translate a clinical challenge that's provided by you, the clinician, and we try to innovate a working prototype solution. It could be a process, it could be some type of uh, computer application with a team of engineering students, and we do all of this in, in eight months. Uh, we, we also form a team of folks like you, clinicians, engineering students, faculty, and it can include some uh, key patients, uh, other folks in the health sciences, uh, and the allied health professionals, regulatory consultants, hospital administrators. Part of what we're saying is that to solve these problems, you can't just ask one person, what's your problem, and here's the solution. You have to look at the full piece of how it's going to be regulated, how it's going to be paid for, who's going to be the benefited, and how it's going to benefit them. Uh, you as faculty, if you get involved, you get to learn all about the medical device uh, process uh, and uh, learn about medical entrepreneurship or medical technology entrepreneurship, regulatory, benchmarking of looking at other devices, creating intellectual property, understanding how to get these things funded. And my experience is that a tremendous number of clinicians are interested in this. A lot of them sort of have engineering backgrounds or ha have, you know, frustrations of how things are not working right. So we have a very uh, energetic audience of, of clinicians that we work with. And it's really a first step to, uh, to creating something new, uh, to generate patents, to create preliminary data for publications, for grant applications, and then uh, some spin-out companies that we've also had. So, uh, of course, I didn't create this program on my own. The chair of mechanical engineering has been tremendously supportive. He's not here on this, on this slide here, Per Reinhall. Uh, and uh, the folks that really have gotten this work done, I'll mention Kat Steele. She's a new assistant professor in mechanical engineering. Her research is in biomechanics. Uh, she's a tremendously uh, intelligent and creative person. She spent a lot of time at Stanford in the design school there and working on biodesign projects. And uh, she's brought a lot of uh, you know, uh, new, new ideas and new energy to the program. Keith Chan uh, was an undergraduate in engineering and has advanced degrees from Stanford in engineering. Worked in medical device companies for about a decade and then went back and got his MD and now is a fellow in interventional radiology. He also spent time at Stanford in the D School in biodesign. And so he comes to us and brings the, really all the perspectives of medical devices, working as a clinician, connections to the med school. And then uh, Professor John Liu, who's an associate professor in mechanical engineering, uh, came to us just a couple of years ago. And his research is in, um, uh, in a point of care diagnostics for cancer using uh, handheld optical probes and, and molecular dyes. 
We also have a tremendous number of partners across the campus and outside. Comotion, may, many of you may be familiar with them. They're the people who handle IP, but really do education and different uh, programs across campus to, to, to uh, make UW a very innovative place. Uh, ITHS, which many of you are familiar with. I see Meher and maybe other people from ITHS here working closely with them. Uh, the nice thing about working with ITHS is they really have a different mission in some ways of providing services that help facilitate the kind, kinds of things that we do. So if we make a medical device and we need to get it into a clinical environment, they can help us a lot with IRBs, recruiting patients and doing other things to make sure these products can get in the hands of, of patients. Uh, the Brooks Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, helping us with uh, business and, uh, and other um, entrepreneurship activities. We get projects from Seattle Children's Hospital. And then Product Creation Studio is a local design firm that it helps us with design. Of course, we're working tremendously a lot with the Department of, of, of uh, in the School of Medicine and also in the Department of Medicine. And we have a lot of different individual specialties here that we've dealt with. There's probably more than this, but these are the ones in the last two years that we've interacted with. Also, we have projects from the School of Nursing and Dentistry. So we really engage a lot of folks around campus. So when when people think of medical technology innovation process, a lot of times a graphic like this comes together where people think, hey, I just have a super great idea and I have a lot of great ideas. And then I just make one that looks really good a lot better and then it just goes to market, okay? It doesn't really work that way. There's a bunch of reimbursement and regulatory and finance and all the other things that stand in this way. But I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about the other side of this plot right here which is this gather generates, you know, design objectives part, which is basically outside of this sort of innovation funnel. And the reason here is that you can't design a great product or a device if you don't understand who will be using it and who will be used on and why it's important and what drives it. You have to understand the need and the people that interact with it before you can even start to think of what the right idea is. Because if you create ideas, before you understand the need, then you end up something that, that just doesn't fit the bill. So I'm gonna talk, uh, have a few slides on different ways that design is done. Um, and there is a whole philosophy about design and different ways of coming up with design. And there's a whole department here, the human-centered um, design and engineering department that, that creates new methods for design, that actually teaches this and practices design. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about just three ways here. So one is called the act of insight. And um, this is a, a story about uh, a man that went hiking uh, in Switzerland. And he, uh, went, while he was hiking in the mountains, his clothes and his dog got these little cockle furs on them and stuck to his fur. And uh, he then took one of these little cockle burrs out and looked at it under the microscope and realized, okay, these little hooks here must uh, be latched to the fur of the dog. And then, this was about 1940, went on and invented what we know now as Velcro, okay? So we call this the active insight or observation of the world around you, which then creates a vision for what could be. And this is a microscopic image of, of these little cock, of, of Velcro, which looks a lot like these cockle burrs, and then the, the, the backing of the, of the Velcro there. So seemingly, if you believe this act of insight that inspired this design, there was no purpose for Velcro at this time. And then Velcro was created and then we created purposes for it, like for our jackets and spacesuits and many other things that we use Velcro for. Um, but in that, in that sense, it was through this observations of the world. There's another way to do design, which I call technology push. And this is a you know, picture of Steve Jobs and the iPad and saying, this is the greatest invention since sliced bread. And you can see that I use only Apple products. I'm a big Apple fanboy. I'm not trying to put down you know, the memory of Steve Jobs. He was clearly a visionary. But part of this is saying, well, you know, maybe Apple is creating products that we don't need. They're just creating amazing products that once they're created, we want them, okay? So I don't think any, I'm not sure that anyone truly needs an Apple Watch or an iPad, but once you get them, they feel like you can't live without them. And so this is part of really the vision of, of that company and of Steve Jobs to create these amazing, product, amazing products. But some people would argue, I'm not necessarily arguing, that it's a technology push, that these things are created and we don't truly need them and they're not coming from the place of need. So the last one I'll talk to you about and really where I want to spend most of my energy is this idea of need-based design. 
And the example that I'll give is from Celestial Navigation. Uh, this is an image of an English quadrant, or also called a backstaff, that was used uh, really in the uh, 17th, 16th and 17th century for doing celestial navigation. And what's interesting is if you look back on navigation, and it's based on these astronomical observations of the sun or moon stars. And in the 1970s, if you were going to sail from, say, Washington to Hawaii, you would be using celestial navigation, 1970, which is incredible. Loran only worked for 500 miles off the coast. There was no GPS. You had radar for looking for other ships and other pieces of land, but you had no way to navigate, really, other than celestial navigation. So this has been around for a long time and continued to use for a long time. You didn't use an English quadrant. You used a sextant and, and, and then a small computer to do it. But um, back in the 16th, 17th centuries, the uh, latitude was determined by this backstaff. And it was used to measure the altitude of the celestial body. And then you determine longitude by what's called dead reckoning. And I always thought dead reckoning had this name because basically it was so inaccurate that you'd probably be dead. <laughs> but when I looked up the origin of this word, it's actually from deduced reckoning. And the, and, and the phrase was changed, which means I'm basically deducing my position from, from the latitude and time. So what you needed was you needed to know often your velocity, you needed to know time, and you needed tables to figure out where you were. And then there's this quote, um, which is, nothing is so much wanted and desired at sea as the discovery of longitude for the safety and quickness of voyages, the preservation of ships, and the lives of men. Because lots of people died crashing into things uh, when they didn't really understand their longitude. And um, the problem here is that you can't accurately estimate the time. And if you don't know the time, then you can't figure out what your position is. And so time was incredibly important. In 1714, there was a Longitudinal Act, which was an act of parliament. They gave 20,000 pounds out for a solution, which could find the longitude within a half a degree, which is equivalent to two minutes of time. And uh, so m this is the actual original uh, you know, scroll here of the act. And um, the accurate pendulum clocks, of course, existed, but uh, they didn't work at sea because of the changes in uh, temperature and humidity and the rocking of the boat and other things. And so. Um, John Harrison was a carpenter and who worked on clocks in his spare time, and he developed a series of marine chronometers from 1730 to 1771, with the first voyage being in 1736 on a clock called the H1, and this was his original clock. I think this is a picture from a museum in the, in the UK. And then his final design, which is H4, which was basically used for, uh, for many, many, for decades or um, in... in um, on ships uh, really around the world. And so uh, when I see need-based design, I'm saying people are dying, people are getting lost, they're wasting time and energy, and they need a better way to figure out where they are. And so uh, they put out this prize, and someone made a great clock. So this is need-based design. And it brought the whole country together to try to create this clock. So very different than the act of insight, or a technology push. Didn't make a clock that would work on ships and then try to sell it to every ship captain. Okay, it's a very different perspective. So this very famous uh, uh, quote by Henry Ford, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's true that when you ask people what they want, they generally have a very limited vision of what's possible. And so there's an actual science and a tremendous amount of energy that we spend trying to talk to you all as clinicians and administrators and patients to figure out not what you want, but what you need. And in our class, we, we often ask people, what is your challenge? And they tell us, and they also tell us their solution. And we say, thanks, great, yeah. And then we just, you know, we <laughs> cut that out and we put it away, not because it's not a good idea, but there are many ideas that need to be looked at, and that idea may meet 60 or 70 percent of all the needs, but may not be meeting the needs of the patient, or meeting the needs of the nurse, or meeting the needs of the physical therapist, or meeting the needs of the administrator, or the regulatory body. So there's a lot of other stakeholders involved in this process. So this is the kind of uh, design process that we follow. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is from a Stanford D school. But this empathize and define. This is what we're talking about, the need. We need to go into the hospital. We need to understand um, the challenges that you face. We need to read your papers. We need to talk to the nurses. Anyone involved in the process, we need to talk to them 
Then we come up with ideas. These ideas should fit these needs and this, the definitions that we set forth, and then we build a prototype and test. And then this is an iteration. After we build the prototype and test it, we realize it didn't work for everyone. And we go back and we say, you know what? We didn't really understand what you were talking about. So that we come back, we talk to you more. And so this is just really a big loop. It's not as linear as it looks. Uh, if you go, I think this was originally from the ITHS website. Um, and basically, you know, how innovation tends to happen in the medical field is you have some basic research or some technology developed. You build a little prototype. You do some little preclinical study and uh, some product development, and then you do more clinical study to show that it's effective, and then potentially it becomes routine clinical use. And this is just an example of the funding agencies and organizations that, that sponsor and, and facilitate this kind of work. Engineering and medicine tends to live in this space, so very early research and prototype development. But more importantly, we want to live in the space, which is just to the lower left of this, which is to work with all of you to say what are those unmet needs in the health sciences in, in taking care of patients and bring them to the program so that we can get started on them now. Because there's a lot of things that we're not talking about that need to be addressed. And so what comes out of our program is a prototype or process or an app, intellectual property, preliminary data that helps you do the things you want to do like publish, change patients' lives, um, get funding for your work. So with that, with that kind of background, I'm just going to uh, talk about, I think it is three projects that we developed within our program. And then I'll talk about, I'll spend maybe one minute on five others just to give you a flavor of the breadth of things that we talk about. There's no better way to tell you what we do other than just to show you. So this is a team called Epi for All. Um, and uh, these are the students here, their names right here. And then the, me the clinical mentors are Ken Lanao and Ben Carney, and they're from radiology. And their mentor within our program was Keith Chan, who's, of course, also in radiology. And you'll see quite a few projects here from radiology because Keith Chan did a very good job at, at recruiting them. So anaphylaxis, um, I will uh, try to lecture you on what that is. I'm sure you all know better than I do. But the, the startling thing for me is that there's an there's a ER visit uh, every three minutes uh, for this condition, this severe allergic reaction. And I know at my son's school, there's like no peanuts and no wheat and no milk and there's like no nothing. You can eat like air and cucumber for lunch. So it, it seems very serious to me. Um, my, my kids don't suffer from this, but I, I know it's, it's very scary for a lot of people. Uh, the great thing about this allergic reaction is that you just take this injection of epinephrine and then you're just all better, right? And uh, if you're not afraid of needles, then you could just buy these little ampules or you could probably get them. Uh, uh, you, you, you guys could prescribe them, I, I assume, and then you just buy one of these, um, you know, hypodermic needles and, and you're good. Of course, uh, we can't trust the general public with that, so they need to buy an EpiPen or an AbbVie Q. Uh, the problem is they cost a lot of money and they expire quickly. And so uh, this is a pretty timely story. This was, a, this was a project from last year. You've probably all seen the press. Everyone's just really bummed out about how much these cost. And, um, you know, uh, congressional hearings and profit margins and, you know, golden parachutes, and it's just disgusting. From a medical device perspective, I think, okay, this is a device-drug combo. That is the hardest thing to get through the FDA. It's, it's very, very difficult. It costs a lot of money. And everyone who does marketing from these companies needs a huge, you know, budget from buying donuts and other things, you know. So <laughs> someone has to support that kind of activity. Okay, but obviously, you know, $600 or $500, whatever it is, is too much. And uh, everyone needs access to this medication to save their life. I mean, it, it's pretty clear. So what we came up with is a need statement, and this is incredibly important in our process, which is a single sentence which tries to define what the quintessential problem is that we're trying to solve. Of course, there's other information that goes along with this, but let's see how this does. A way to address anaphylaxis by dis distributing uh, an affordable auto injector that accommodates available glass ampules so that deaths and serious injuries can be prevented. Okay? So the key insight here that this team ma uh, made was that epinephrine is a pretty robust medication that you can get in glass ampules across the globe. It's relatively cheap, and if you have to replace it, it's just a few dollars. So it's not a big deal to get epinephrine. The problem is how do you get it in your body in a reasonable way? And so the key insight they had was, well, we'll just have a glass ampule, and we'll just stick it in a device. 
and then we just have to figure out a way to get it in people's body. If the epinephrine expires, then we'll just take the glass ampule out and we'll put a new one in. It doesn't solve all the problems, but uh, fundamentally it's, it's a good idea to basically separate the drug and uh, the device because it also allows you to get through a regulatory process which has nothing to do with a drug-device combo and it also allows you to put other drugs in there as they come along or for other purposes. So I have a video of their kind of quick pitch that they're going to show, but I'm worried that you're not going to be able to hear it. So we'll try for 30 seconds, and if it doesn't work, then I'll just narrate it. If I were to have a severe allergic reaction right now, with it means I would be unable to breathe. But since I live in a developed country, I have access to an epigen. I can simply self-inject and save my life. But in developing countries, they don't have access to this life-saving epipen because it costs up to $500 for a two-pack. All they have are these epinephrine glass ampules, which must be manually injected by a trained medical professional. As a nonprofit, we at for All are working with this existing metal infrastructure by creating a device that was used to simply preload the ampule into the device, making it a portable, ready-to-use auto-injected like the epipen, but for under $3. So to give you an idea of how this works, we're actually going to do a prototype demonstration for you. So what I do is I take the cap off, I put in some tracker dye so that I can see that it works. I load the ampule in head first, then I place the cap in. Now this device is portable and ready to use like an EpiPen. So there are many benefits of using a glass ampule instead of having to use like the EpiPen. First of all, I'll narrate it the second time for those so who can't hear it. Must hear be it. A sterile method to keep the sterile drug. And it also has to be filed with the FDA as a drug to find more epinephrine expires in our device. So when I press this button, that's going to break the case. Then I can inject into this whole infection. If it's open, we should see. So when I cut this open, we should see some green dye. The self inject. All right, so I'm going to narrate the second time because I hear, I see several people kind of putting a cup over their ear like this, so that means you can't hear. So basically, this is a team of these four students, and they created that white prototype that you see. He's holding up the glass ampule saying, hey, this epinephrine is available to people across the globe, but they have no way of getting it in their bodies. So basically, what he says is that we have this device, and we're going to put the glass ampule inside the device. So at some point, he, he talks about a, a tracking dye, which is basically green food coloring. So he opens the device, and he, right now he's taking the top off, and he puts a couple drops of green dye in there. And that's so that you can see the medicine that's delivered to the orange. So then after he puts the drops in, he's going to put the glass ampule in. He closes it up. Then he talks for a little bit, which I'm not going to try to repeat. But he's basically saying, look, the drug is separate from the device. Um, and uh, the, the EpiPen is great, but it costs too much money, right? This is what he's saying in the in long version, but I, I don't really do it justice. Okay, let's see if I can get to the part where he uses the device. Okay. So he presses one button. That first button breaks the glass ampule. Then he uses it like an injector pen, which he presses down, which makes the needle come out. Now he's cutting open the orange, and what you can't see very well is the orange is just green inside, meaning that he broke the glass ampule and he injected the green dye, and he shows the orange to everyone, and there's, you know, cheers all around. In fact, it had only worked a few times before this. It was a very risky maneuver for him to pitch it this way, but it really worked beautifully. And um, if you could hear him speak, he's very eloquent, and these guys were involved in the Health Innovation Challenge, the Business Plan Competition, and they're working now with PATH over in Seattle to try to create more working prototypes to, to, uh, to test out in, in developing countries where you know, access to EpiPens is, is really an impossible thing. So the second project is a project called MISTES, and it's focused on innovative eye medication delivery device. Uh, here's a picture of the team at our symposium. And, um, you know, the, the other thing that I'll point out here, uh, and the risk of sounding a little sexist, is that in engineering, we have, we're very underrepresented uh, women uh, in, in our programs. Um, I think we have, I think, 20% of women enrolled in our classes. I know in medicine, the gender uh, um, equity is, is much better, at least from my personal experience, it seems better. I don't know the numbers. But uh, about uh, six of our eight teams were led by very strong and powerful and intelligent and creative women. And I think uh, this field of melding health and engineering 
is uh, very interesting and attractive to, to uh, women who are studying engineering and uh, has really uh, empowered our program. Um, this next project is led by Joanne Wen, who's in ophthalmology, uh, and then I helped this team from an uh, engineering perspective. perspective. So glaucoma, again, you probably know a lot more than I do, but just a few facts here. It affects 60 million people globally, 4 million in North America, second highest cause of irreversible blindness. The average age of the patients is, is, uh, is, is uh, relatively uh, late in their life, 69. And 86% um, of the patients, they give them their own medications to themselves. And 80% uh, of these patients are really unable to properly administer their medications independently, which means that they're not getting medicine they need. Uh, and it's very difficult for them. Uh, so if you look at this pie graph, this kind of shows the reason it's difficult for them. One is that patients of this age group, it's often hard for them to tilt their head back to put their eye drops in. Uh, the other one is uh, they're not aiming accurately because they're leaning back here and you know of course it's very difficult to aim an eye drop you know into your into the lower eyelid uh, when your head's back like that or, or in any time unless you're looking in a mirror which sometimes is still difficult they don't 16 percent don't pull their eyelid down 13 percent touch the eye dropper to their eye uh, 10 percent have shaking hands uh, some are blinking unable to open the bottle cap so there's a whole host of reasons uh, why they're unable to deliver their eye medication. Um, you know, 20% of the patients were unable to administer it without using a lot of excess medication, which would require them to buy more medication, which they have to go back and they get their prescription or talk to their pharmacist about why it was wasted, it ran out early. So it's, it's, it's a complicated thing going on. 78% um, of patients from this one study said they want a device to help them. And, um, you know, you end up in wasted medication and poor adherence and, and needing additional care. If you go online and you look for, you know, eye drop assistance devices, you'll see lots of stuff. You'll, you'll see a Simply Touch where you put the drop of medication on this little stick and then touch it to your eye and throw it away. Uh, the auto squeeze, which basically helps you squeeze the bottle and uh, do somewhat of an alignment to the eye. The drop in, which is almost like glasses for an eye dropper, okay, where you put it on the bridge of your nose. And then these disposable spray caps, which is like spraying, um, you know, um, a cleanser on your glasses or something. And, you do that and you, and you use 10 times as much medication and you basically spray your whole face, okay? <laughs> so, it, so these are trying to get at the problem, they're just poorly done and they don't meet what we call the core functions. They don't help you with your neck extension problem or your manual dexterity problem or they don't get the medication volume right or they don't align properly. They meet some of the needs but not all of them. So basically if they don't meet all the needs then it's not a viable solution. So their need statement is, a simple and efficient way for elderly patients with limited manual dexterity and neck mobility to properly administer eye medications independently. There's a very clear definition of what the challenge is. And their solution uh, was this device that they call the Mist Ease. And um, it's basically this handheld device. She's ho holding it here with this little button that you press, and then a spray of liquid comes out. And there's this little comfort cone here that sits up against your eye socket. And then this little slot here, which allows you to pull down your lower lid so that you get the medication where you need it. It's got a nice ergonomic handle. Basically, when you pick this thing up, you know exactly how to handle it because of the way it's shaped. And there's like little indentions for your fingers so that you understand. And then you screw the eye medication right in the top. If you look on the inside of this thing, there's this uh, little mechanism that we engineers call the Scotch yoke, you know, four bar linkage. <laughs> Um, and basically the eye medication goes in here with a little spray nozzle. And what's cool about this is that to get this in the device, you need to take that little spout off the top of the existing eye medication. And that's actually hard to do. If we had that in front of me, I would be touching it and, you know, getting my germs all over it and I would probably break it. But they built this little thing in the back where you just put it in there and you just yank it off just like a beer bottle cap. So, um, this team uh, was, uh, after they finished, they were funded by a, an opportunity fund called the Engineering Innovation and Medicine Opportunity Fund. This comes through mechanical engineering. All these teams actually ended up with a U.S. provisional patent application. But the reason I have this sort of follow-up slide for this project is that Joanne uh, Wen is uh, getting an IRB to evaluate the effectiveness of this for self-administration of uh, eye di um, a medication used to dilate eyes in her practice. 
So it's a very low risk study, but basically she'll have people self-administer these drops in their eyes to dilate their eye, and then she'll also use this spray. So it's not like we're going through 20 years of regulatory process or, you know, this is like a first in human surgical process. I mean, this is something where you can deliver eye medication. It's relatively low risk. She can get enough data to publish a paper potentially and say, this device worked better than this, these other things and this number of patients had this feedback, right? It's an evaluation, but she can also use that data to further fund her project to get potentially NIH funding or to, uh, to, look, to you know, work towards commercialization. So I don't know jo all of Joanne's intent to work with this device, but it's now becoming part of her research portfolio among other projects that she has. So I think the last project that I'll speak about any detail about is this ILMA, which is an intubating laryngeal mask airway. And this team is made up of these four students plus uh, their clinical mentor, who's Taylor Sawyer here in the middle. And he's in pedi pediatrics in the division of neonatology, he works in um, the neonatal ICU, and uh, I also uh, mentored this team. So um, they were working on a way to intubate uh, neonates, and there's four million uh, newborns each year. 10% of those require some oxygen, including my son required oxygen. I think the term they used was blow-by oxygen, which is they have an oxygen line that basically like a nasal cannula that they didn't stick in his nose, but it was just like a rich area of oxygen around his head, okay? and. Uh, and um, one in 500 of those require intubation. And uh, so that's about 8,000 babies a year. And I guess that doesn't seem like a tremendous number committed to the 4 million, but uh, you know, for the parents of those individual children, for those of us who do have children, you know, every single one of these lives are tremendously precious. And um, so uh, this technology is just um, really needed. This is a cartoon that Taylor Sawyer shared with me uh, and and he, I think he uses this with his trainees, which is, you know, you're, you're probably getting trained on these procedures and you're using mannequins and other things or maybe other animals for these models like cats or ferrets. I don't know exactly what people are being trained on. But in real life, when you have a parent that's freaked out behind you and a baby that's crying and maybe weighs two or two and a half pounds, I imagine for you all or for people who do this work, it's tremendously stressful and tremendously difficult. I have not been in that situation, but I just imagine, I don't make to make light of it, but I just imagine that it is a very difficult position to be in. There is some data that suggests that uh, residents and first year fellows are just not good at intubation. They just don't have enough time at the helm in doing this. It's very just clear that they need more time to be trained. And uh, the, the, the very best trained folks, a respiratory therapist or attending, have much better rates, but as a parent, I'm not really interested in having the clinician stand in front of me and say, I need to intubate your child. There's like 50% chance that I'm going to get this right on the first time, right? I mean, we need the rates to be higher is my, is my understanding, or that's what Taylor tells us. So what's the difficulty in intubating? Well, the success rates are, you know, 20% in residents and 70% for highly trained specialists. Uh, severe oxygen desaturations occur over 50% of the time, which often result in cardiac arrest. Um, and then repeated attempts of intubation. If you don't get it right the first time, you have to try again, of course, and then that can create all sorts of damage uh, that I outline here. So there's another device called an LMA, and they're available for a PEDS patients, but uh, what Taylor says is they're not a secure airway, which means, fine, we can use it to oxygenate the child and bring their oxygen levels up, but then we're still going to have to pull it out and intubate. So it doesn't really get rid of the problem of intubating. So the need statement for this is a method for safely and consistently intubating neonates resulting in a secure and long-term airway, okay, which basically takes out the LMA for, for consideration for the most part. Um, so the key insight that this team made was that if given more time, so the black is shown with, uh, with a requirement that you have to do it under 40 seconds, and if they had more time, their success rates went up dramatically. So what this team said is we need to buy the clinician more time to intubate. With more time and being careful and getting rid of that stress of, I need to do this immediately or this child might have brain damage, then the success rates would go way up. So the invention here was what is called an ILMA. So it is an LMA, but it's an intubating LMA, which is not a new concept completely, but the way that, the way that this team has done it is very unique. So it's basically an LMA. It has this rigid body. It has this cuff that 
fits into, uh, you know, this, uh, basically the epiglottis is fitting right over this top of this cuff. This is fitting basically down the esophagus, and this is pointed right at the trachea where the oxygen comes out. Um, it has a soft material, so it, it builds a nice seal. And then right here is a video camera and an LED that allows you to see exactly what you need to see. And then this track right here is really the, the tremendously unique part. It's called the endotracheal tube tack, track. And basically, the endotra uh, endotracheal tube fits right down this track and allows you to intubate. But I'm going to show a video of how this works, and I'll probably stop it several times. Um, so here is the device. Uh, you know, black is not exactly the favorite color, I think, for medical devices. But when you're making early prototypes, you're really after things like material properties, rigidity, <laughs> material strength, and not after, you know, does this look and feel like a medical product? Of course, if there was blood or something on this, you'd have a difficult time seeing it. So it wouldn't be the final cover, a color. But you can see the, uh, the uh, LED right here and camera. And then uh, here's the little uh, neonate uh, mannequin. And then right here, this is the screen that you would be looking at. And so you're just basically looking at a wall here, so you see nothing on the screen. And this is Stefan, who's an engineer, staff engineer in our program, who's continued to work with Taylor after the students all graduated. And he was working on the original project. So right now, he's just shoving the LMA in. And if you see, already on the camera, you can see the trachea, right? So I imagine, in this situation, you'd like to know, is anything obstructed? Is there a narrowing? Does everything look clear? Is there blood? So you have a nice view of, of the airway here. Now, at this point, you have an LMA in there. You can just put the bag over it and pump oxygen in if you wanted. So now the oxygen saturation level would come up, and everyone's feeling like, OK, this baby's getting plenty of oxygen. Okay? So now that takes the stress off. It's not a secure airway, but the baby's receiving oxygen. And then uh, after, uh, let's say, the baby is slightly stabilized, then you would intubate in this way, where you slide the intubation tube down, and you saw, I don't know if you saw it, but the, the intubation tube went straight into the trachea. Now, not much alignment, I'll back up a little bit more, not much alignment was required, okay? He has this pretty well set up for the mannequin, okay? But of course, the physiology and the size of babies and everything changes. So the real truth here is that if you were able to intubate quickly for a child and it just went straight in, then you're done. If not, at least you have visual access to say, did it go in? Do I need to tweak this thing up or down or move their head or, you know, adjust their neck at all to, to get this thing in? So I'll show you this video one more time, but this is where he bags, and then you can see the chest is moving there, and he, he has his hand on there to make sure the chest is moving. So first, he uses the LMA. He gets a good visual access to the trachea here. He could be delivering oxygen before that, but instead he intubates straight away. You see the intubation tube going through the video monitor. Then he pulls the LMA out, and then, uh, then he can uh, provide oxygen or, or air to the, the baby, and you can see the chest move. So what's different about this technology than the existing intubating LMAs, if you go and you Google intubating LMAs, you'll be like, there's like 30 products. What is Jonathan talking about? Well, the way that people do it now is they pass the intubation tube through the main channel of the LMA. And so when you do that, if you put the LMA in, you're providing air. Then when you're ready to intubate, you have to take that air off and then try to intubate. And if you don't get it right, you have to pull the intubation tube out and put the bag back on. So it doesn't really get rid of this stress of, of, of intubating. Uh, and so this, and it's a very complicated procedure. There's a video of an intubating LMA, and it's like a 20-minute video with nine parts, you know, where you put the LMA in, you provide oxygen, then you intubate, and then you're using, like, this video system that you have to slide in, and then you try to intubate, and then you pull it out, and then you have this other device that you have to press in there to make sure the tube stays in when you're pulling the LMA out. It's a very complicated procedure. And even the tiniest little change in, um, in design can be really enabling, I think, for a technology. So his project is actually was funded by a Coulter grant and through an a innovation fund through Commotion. The prototypes are being evaluated by training with residents. So this is a image from uh, Taylor actually training his residents using the ILMA. And he's seeking additional funding uh, for regulatory work and first in human work. And he really wants to license this out and, and commercialize it so that he can have access to it. I should be ending. Is that right? Yeah, OK. I'm going to spend 30 seconds on each one of these slides to give you an idea of what we do. This is a uh, needle biopsy system for taking uh, yeah, needle biopsies. And it uh, eliminates uh, pneumothoraces. So uh, pneumothorax uh, often happens you're taking a lung biopsy. And this device allows you to evacuate 
the pleural space that would cause a pneumothorax. This is a picture of my daughter um, where they're uh, using a mobile phone app and the camera from the mobile, fam mobile phone app to look at capillary refill time as a way of uh, diagnosing um, um, uh, sepsis and other uh, uh, shock in, in developing nations. This project was uh, with Matthew Thompson. Here's a project where they're using a little electronic device for monitoring hematuria when doing a continuous bladder irrigation. Well, this one was with Wayne Brisbane in urology. And here's a project with Mika Sinanen where he does a lot of stoma surgeries. They end up in hernias. And there's no good belt that people can wear to eliminate these uh, hernias. And so this is a picture of uh, Beth Halsney wearing this stoma belt and has a nice little cuff here and a rigid shape and a fully adjustable BOA system, almost like a, a pair of um, snowboard boots. It's adjustable like that. And this project is very interesting because I mentioned Wayne Quinton at the beginning of the talk who created this, uh, the Quinton uh, shunt for dialysis. So he had a stoma and he worked on stoma belts for the last decade of his life. And then he passed and his wife basically gave us boxes and boxes of his prototypes and said, please build it, you know, in my husband's memory, please build something, a better stoma belt because he had a hernia and he had many surgeries and it really affected his way of life. And Mika Sinanen and the program came together to create this belt. And so we're moving forward on that project and trying to get um, um, some work done on humans. So I will end with basically uh, one quick last message, which is that um, when, if you're interested in working with us, it's relatively easy to start, okay? You need some problem that you wanna solve, okay? You need to fill out a one-page intake form, which I argue for you is probably 15 or 20 minutes. Like, this is my problem. This is how many people are dying or being affected. This is why it's so important. Here are some of the constraints. It must do this. It must be sterile. must be disposable. Some of those things. And then after you write that one, one page document or three sections, you give a 10 minute pitch, reverse pitch. You say, this is why my project's important. Then you talk to the engineering team and we ask you lots of questions. And then you get a Assuming your project gets picked up, you get a team assigned to you, and you will work with them with either 10 weeks and a quarter, or if your project continues for a whole year to get a prototype like the ones that I showed you. So I'm going to um, end on that. The other slides that I had was this really confusing slide about our program and how we take 50 projects a year and we get 70 students and all this kind of thing. And I'm just going to skip that, because if you're more interested, you can come to me and I can explain that to you in person. So with that, I will and be happy to answer any questions that you have.